My name is Seth Irwin. I'm one of the board members for, for WAC, and I have the, the pleasure of being the first moderator. <laughs> um, so I want to introduce uh, Gretchen Dietrich, um, uh, who uh, uh, is coming to give the first talk. Uh, so Gretchen Dietrich is the executive director of the Utah Museum of Fine Arts at the University of Utah. Uh, before becoming executive director, uh, um, she served as the director of public programs and cultural affairs and interim director for the uh, UMFA. Okay. Uh, she served for four years as the executive director of the Utah Museums Association, a nonprofit professional membership organization serving Utah's museum community. And uh, she, before that, she was director at the Wadsworth uh, Athenaeum Museum of Art in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, she holds an MA in art history from Temple University and an undergraduate degree in art history from Chestnut Hill College. And with that, I'm going to pass this to her to uh, give the first talk of the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And just one thing to fix that Seth said. I wasn't the director of the Wadsworth. I was the director of education. <laughs> Tiny scale change there, difference there. I just want to say what we do is so important. You know, we take care of things that, um, that, that really matter. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've been getting emails from colleagues in Houston. I've been getting emails um, from colleagues through colleagues, uh, from people in Ponce and San Juan. And um, it's terrifying, right? I mean, it is really terrifying. And um, not only do we worry about the health and safety and well-being of our staff um, and of the people living in our community, but of course, people who do what we do, we go right to worrying about the well-being of collections as well. And, um, and what does a museum look like when there's six feet of standing water in the streets? I don't really understand what that is like. Um, but I, so I'm humbled to be here in front of you. Um, we are really grateful um, uh, to, to have you here in Salt Lake City. I also um, share um, uh, Alberta's hopes that this is a really wonderful and fruitful conversation for you. So um, with great respect for what you do and the work that you do, um, I am just delighted to be here. And, and no pressure to be the first talk. But but, um, and I also want to say a giant thanks to Randy, who slightly had to talk me into this because I'm an art, you know, I'm an art historian. I'm an art museum educator. Um, I don't do what you do, and I don't even feel like I talk the right lingo. So, in consultation with my own staff, some of whom are in the room today, I've tried to kind of make sure that what I'm telling you is true. And um, and if I uh, do stray from that, I know that they will raise their hands and be like, "Well, Gretchen, that's not exactly right." But um, so the idea was that we wanted to kind of catch you up on this interesting um, and challenging period of time at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. So let me begin, and I've scripted it just so I stay within my time, but um, we can talk about whatever you want to after. So the UMFA um, was closed for 19 months, which is a long time in the life of an art museum, while we made upgrades to our award-winning and very beautiful Marcia and John Price Museum building. And I will just say, go to the third floor of the library, um, which is on the plaza level, go out the plaza and take a right and you will see this building. Um, and that's the museum, your, your badge will get you in. We're um, open on Wednesday nights till 9 p.m. And I know you have a lot of um, free time for lunches and we have a fabulous cafe. So just so you know everything that, that you could take advantage of. So come have lunch. Um, and we house in the museum, uh, we've been on campus for about 100 years, and we house a collection of about 21,000 art objects with a whole bunch of stuff. So everything from um, ancient Greek and Roman artifacts to modern and contemporary pieces, um, all kinds of material, all kinds of things are on view at the museum and of course in storage. Only about 2% of our collection is on view, um, like most museums. The museum was built, um, designed by Machado and Silvetti, a fancy um, architectural firm in Boston, who has built they have built a number of museum, art museums, uh, in their uh, practice. And um, we opened this building in June of 2001. So relatively speaking, not that long ago, which was something a little challenging for our project to explain to people why we needed to spend money and effort to fix the building that was so new. Um, but we knew pretty much from the time that we opened the building that we were going to have some challenges maintaining proper museum quality environmental controls in the building without really damaging the building. It was hard 
on a high dry desert environment. So we had, for example, efflorescence on the outside of the building envelope in the winter time. We had a terrible condensation problem on the interior windows of the building. Some windows were worse than others, um, but that was, you know, to begin almost every workday in the winter um, by mopping up water, not a great idea. Um, and we, um, we knew, uh, I think for quite a bit of time, that we probably had mold in growing in certain spots in the building because of that warm, moist air. We were able to keep the, the standard um, uh, humidity level in the museum pretty good to what it needed to be, but we knew that that warm, moist air was going out of the building, and we knew that that was impacting the building and potentially even growing some mold in some places. So, um, so we, while we were able to care for the collection, you know, on those industry standards, and, and we felt pretty good about that, we knew um, that it was a big challenge for the structure itself. And we essentially, um, my predecessor, um, the director before me, was talking with the university facilities people from really the, almost, I think, the moment the building opened about these challenging issues. And um, as time passed, I think the university facilities engineers and so on became increasingly worried really about the structural integrity of our building going forward. Um, and so uh, while we talked sort of seemingly endlessly, it seems like the conversation got a little more um, pointed as time passed. And I became director in 2010, um, and I recall being asked by the university facilities folks to operate our building at plus or minus 35% relative humidity, um, which of course with, for an art museum is not going to work. Um, and they were very disappointed because they felt that if we would just simply do that, the building would be fine. Um, so you can see the sort of conflict that had, had where we found ourselves. Um, the university hire, hired then, not in consultation with us, a local company to conduct some testing. Um, they were, they had this idea if we just had more information about what's really happening, we'll know how to fix it. Um, and unfortunately, they hired a company with little experience in issues, with issues that we were, such as we were facing, um, and really zero experience dealing with any kind of collections-based, um, objects-based uh, organization, which of course gave us great pause. So in 2010, 2011, at the behest of David Carroll, who I'm sure a lot of you know, and if you don't know, please get to know him. Raise your hand, David. He's our director of collections and exhibitions, and he's been, thanks for, thanks to God, he's been here um, for a long time, sort of holding, holding um, our collections in, uh, in, with care. Um, he had this great idea to ask Michael Henry and Wendy Jessup to consult with us on our project. And I even think we paid for them, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Um, and really to provide another voice in this conversation. And I think, um, I think it was kind of a game changer, and David and I were kind of trying to remember really the sort of how this went down. But and in case you don't know um, Michael and Wendy, and you know, cue the P Peter Pan jokes. How adorable is that? Um, uh, you know, Michael is uh, you know an unimaginably experienced both architect and engineer who's been involved in tons of these building envelope challenges and questions, both uh, really all around the country, and has consulted on many many projects. And Wendy Jessup, um, I believe, had a long career as an objects conservator, objects conservator, I think at the National Gallery, at the Smithsonian, so a person who really knows her stuff when it comes to collections care. The two of them, of course, work together and bring that expertise um, together in such a great way, and they basically helped us to be heard. Um, so, in, so inviting them into the conversation and sort of saying, well, Wendy and Michael think this, and of course David and I kind of had thought it all along, um, it really did change the conversation and it helped us to really um, elevate the level of understanding among our university colleagues who are wonderful people, trained as architects and engineers whose responsibility is to protect the buildings on campus, right? It, that was an important, though, to, to bring in that conversation and understanding around the, the tricky aspects of collections care. So here's an asset of 21,000 art objects made of all different kinds of materials in the basement of this building. You know, there's, that's a different conversation. So eventually the university engaged Simpson, Gumpert, and Hager, um, SGH for short, which is a very large company that I'm sure some of you even have worked with. Um, their client list, uh, collections-based clients include, specifically even for vapor barrier issues, I pulled this off their website, the Austin Public Library, the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, the New Museum in New York City, another relatively speaking new building, right, um, and the National 
Natural History Museum here uh, in Utah. Um, and I wanted to quote just from SGH, which, what, how, what they sort of said about our project. SGH evaluated the existing envelope assemblies and mechanical systems performed performance at the 74,000 square foot UMFA building. We determined an ineffective air barrier assembly contributed to efflorescence and icicle formation. The mechanical system did not optimally control interior humidity and the non-thermally broken window uh, frames condensed water. Working with the project team, SGH developed a cost-effective repair program that allowed the exterior, existing exterior veneer and glazing to remain in place. Our strategy met the museum's budget goals and their desired exhibition schedule. Highlights of the work included the following. Coordinating with the executive director and museum staff to plan testing and repairs, considering preservation of artifacts and exhibition schedule. That's number one, right? Um, analyzing building air tightness with whole building fan pressurization testing and infrared thermo thermography. Designing interior installed continuous air barrier from grade to roof parapet without requiring removal of exterior brick veneer. Recommending pretreatment of, of outside air and modifications to the mechanical system supply ducting and designing a heat trace system to mitigate window condensation. Um, now, we did this, <laughs> um, which is terrifying, right? This is a 60-foot wall in the interior of the building, what we call our Great Hall, and the plan was to remove the interior of every exterior wall, pull out the vapor barrier that was there and put in in 2001, replace it with now fire-graded foam uh, vapor barrier technology, which was not um, safe and uh, approved for construction in 2001. So we basically resealed the, resealed the building from the inside out. Um, the only thing you're really going to see if you come to visit the museum is the window technology. Well, what you'll see is about a one inch cap on the, um, what's that word, David, the mullions. Um, of all of our windows, um, so we because we had aesthetics to contend with too, right? We we needed this to look beautiful, um, and the heat trace is in that um, inside of that little one-inch cap, aluminum cap that you're not really meant to notice, but you can put your hand on the window and you can feel the heat at the, in the window. Um, so in January 2016, we closed temporarily to replace the vapor barrier to make upgrades to the HVAC systems and to install the state-of-the-art state heat trace systems on our windows. And all of this work, um, we, uh, you know, the plan was that all of this work would um, allow us to continue to operate the building the way we need to, to protect the art, but it would keep the building safe further into the future. Um, the museum, the university um, allocated about uh, two and a half million dollars of state appropriated capital improvement funding. So they paid for this part and we took the opportunity to kind of rethink um, what does an art museum do, right? So who do we serve? How could we do what we do even better? And we raised an additional $2.3 million to fund reinstallations of the collections, new programming and so on. Um, so I'm just going to quickly just give you a, a, a tour of what we, um, what we, here's the in store, inside of our store. Um, it was scary. And I should also say that we conducted this project in three phases around the collection. There was no place to move the collection uh, to a different building or a different structure. That was not an option. Um, so we, um, and really the collections team, did an unbelievably wonderful job of protecting the collections, moving, the, moving art objects to different parts of the building as we did the project. And we used, as you might imagine, an enormous amount of plastic. Um, but we, we did a pretty good job of keeping everything just fine. So um, faced with this, um, this sort of daunting prospect of being closed for a year, um, we did take the opportunity to rethink the museum in almost every way. And we focused in the end, I think, on, um, on two things mainly, objects, art, and people. Um, we wanted to really capitalize on the strengths of our dynamic collection, as I already mentioned, is comprised of about 21,000 objects and is very unique in the region for the, its breadth and its depth. And we wanted to make the museum more welcoming and accessible to the many audiences we serve. Unlike many university art museums, we actually really are the Civic Museum, the City Museum, the Municipal Museum of Salt Lake, and we also are the State's Art Museum. So we don't just focus on, um, on faculty and, and students here at the university. We think much more broadly like a civic 
Civic Museum does about who, who we serve. Um, this is a highlight, by the way, of the reinstallation. This is a 17th century French tapestry that hasn't been on view in the new building. So it hasn't been on view for 17 years, and you have to come and see it. It's on the second floor. It's just incredible. So we asked ourselves, <clears throat> How could the UMFA, which in January of 2016 was already pretty wonderful, how could the UMFA be even better? How could the collections shine brighter? How could we serve our visitors and our community more thoughtfully? And as you'll see, um, in, when you enter the museum, all sorts of new wall colors, refinished floors, um, much needed acoustic upgrades in that giant great hall space I showed you, new lights, new carpeting, and a general spiffing up of this 17-year-old building, um, every object on uh, has been reinstalled, and um, we've created all new installations for six of the collections, the European Art Collection, American and Regional Art Collection, African Art, Asian Art, Art of the Pacific, and Modern and Contemporary. And almost 50% of the work on view has either never been on view before or hasn't been on view for a really long time. Like a small museum, many small museums, we have a relatively small curatorial group, so we needed to actually hire some outside expertise to help us with these reinstallations. And you're looking on the far right at Virginia Lee Webb, maybe some of you know her. She worked at the Metropolitan in New York for about 30 years as curator of African and Oceanic Art. We don't have a curator in our faculty or on our uh, art historians on our faculty or curators in the museum with this expertise of this, of this kind of stuff. So working with Virginia was an essential part of this project and so exciting because we've got the stuff, we didn't have the expertise in house and then to have Virginia come and spend a little more than a year making trips from New York back and forth to really help us understand the collections. Um, we'll be doing some, I think, very smart deassessing maybe in the coming years of works of art that really aren't museum quality or or our duplicates or triplicates of other things we have, allowing more space to build the collections more thoughtfully and really working with her to bring work into the collection that makes the collection much stronger. So we're very, very happy about that. Um, and we also, we, we don't have a conservation lab, by the way, at the museum. That's something that David and I have been dreaming about and, and talking about and working towards. Um, but we do have Randy and the amazing folks here at the library, and we do consult with them very closely. Um, we have a vol, yeah, oh, you're telling me time? Oh. Oh, God, okay. Um, this is uh, Catherine Fisher, um, who's a volunteer um, conservator from Europe with great experience as an objects conservator and a specialty in fresco. So the first thing she did for us was to help clean our fresco, which is on view on the second floor a number of years ago. Um, but we recognized with wanting to put all of these art objects on view that hadn't been on view ever or in a long time, we had a lot of conservation issues, mostly minor ones, um, but we had to work very very, you know, with very few um, resources um, in a very wily, smart way to make sure that the work we wanted to put on view was exhibitable, it was safe, and it looked good. Definitely a challenge. Um, very quickly, another feature of all of the installations, but most especially in the modern and contemporary gallery, um, is an increase in work uh, by women and by people historically underrepresented in museum collections. We have a great collection, particularly in modern contemporary, of amazing works of art by women. Some of our best objects are by women artists. But when you visit us now, every work of art that you'll see in this particular gallery was made by a woman or a person who identifies as female. And that felt like an important conversation that's happening nationally, um, even internationally. It has felt like an important conversation to bring here. Another goal was also to in increase the, the, the amount of works on paper on view in the gallery. So almost half of our collection are works on paper, prints, drawings, photographs, and um, like many art museums, we just kept them in the dark in the basement. Now I know for you folks, that's the best of all possible worlds. Um, but we really wanted to show and share these incredible works of art with our community. Um, and so, uh, so and as you know, that's an endeavor all in itself because now we've made a curatorial commitment to making sure that we have rotating um, plans going out. So when this Gustav Bauman print comes down, what will go up in its place? We know that we're increasing the work of the collections department. These things need to be framed framed, they need to be looked after. Um, but making sure that our visitors recognize and see the incredible breadth of our collections was absolutely a goal. Um, we did two, oh, this is a really important slide, and I hope that you will, uh, this will please you. For 
Um, I've been going around talking to everybody who listened to me, and I've made a lot of talks lately, about the magic of mount making. Um, and as Alberta mentioned, we live in a place where, um, where you know, earthquakes happen, and we worry about it and think about it a lot. So one of the collection's goals for David and Robin and our, and our crew there was to really do the very best we could to ensure that if in the event of an earthquake, objects on view would stay safe. And what I love to point out is people don't notice this work. And what I love to point out and to people, and they go, they really go, wow, every three-dimensional object, and you know this, when it's put on display, it gets thought about and talked about. And a team of people figure out how best to show it and how best to make sure that it stays safe. And the way that our collections crew, I think it was Rebecca who probably made this, you know, made this mount and then camouflaged it from your view as a viewer and a visitor is something that I think people need to recognize and understand. And it just, it goes to show how much we love and care about our collections, the degree to which we care for them and we think about them and, and, and want to take care of them. So um, that's been a joy to show my mount making slide. And this is on view in the, in the Chinese um, collection. We only did, we really wanted to focus and celebrate the permanent collections of the museum and this reinstallation. So we only did two artist projects and what you'll see in the Acme Lab, which is on the first floor on the left side of the building, um, is the work of these two incredible women, um, Lisa and Janelle Inglesias. When they work together, they call themselves Las Hermanas Inglesias and they have this combined practice but also a separate practice. They've activated this new Acme Lab space for us, which is all about sort of new ways of thinking about museum work and bringing people to art. Um, and in this space, you might have a heart attack, but visitors are allowed to touch everything. So you can play dress up, you can make sculptures, you, can, you are activating this space and participating with the art. We also did a really beautiful installation, a site-specific installation with Spencer Finch, who's an amazing artist based in New York. And you can see the little line in this giant space. That, by the way, is the same wall that I showed you that had come down to the studs. Um, we put it back. Um, and we invited Spencer to come and do a site-specific project where he basically hiked around the Great Salt Lake with a Pantone book, made note of all the colors that he saw in the sky and on the ground and in the water, and installed them in literally the color that he saw, um, installed them, I think, 1,372 Pantone chips around the entire interior of the space. So you're invited to visit the UMFA and essentially circumnavigate the, the Great Salt Lake through Spencer's eyes. Um, and underneath these, he wrote lake, 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 mountain, mountain, bird, stone. It's beautiful. And here he is sort of doing his thing. Um, in addition to the collections, we've thought equally about people, as I already said, and sort of how does it feel to visit our museum? How can we make people feel more welcome? We're pretty sure that for many of our visitors and students here, this might be the first art museum they've ever visited before. So we like to think of our museum as a training museum. And what better gift could you give a person than to help them to understand that they're welcome, that they too can navigate the art museum so that when they go to San Francisco, they know what to do and they're off and running. Um, and we thought about um, how people are in the museum. So we created three conversation areas where you can sit, charge your phone, um, look around, think about architecture, um, hang out, nurse a baby, um, look at materials, um, read things uh, on, on that we've provided. Um, we also rewrote every single label, 500 didactic materials, and we translated three of the collections fully into Spanish, which has been a goal for us for a long time. Um, we also, while we were closed, worked out in the community. We partnered with this library, we partnered with the Salt Lake Public Library, and held a number of convenings about issues that matter to our community today through the lens of art and creativity, um, and really met people who don't typically visit the UMFA, made a lot of new connections with uh, creative people in our community, which is exciting and which informs our practice at the museum. Um, and then we continued, as we do here, um, doing K through 12 outreach and bringing art education, art objects, not from our permanent collection, from our teaching collection, into classrooms all over the state of Utah. The smallest high school in the United States is in the state of Utah. It's an hour off a dirt road out west of Delta, Utah, towards the Nevada border. It's 14 kids. Um, and we go there. And I think that's really important. <laughs> 
Um, so even while we were closed in one fiscal year we were closed, we served 15,000 school children. So it has definitely been a challenging period of time for us. We worried and we fretted about doing a construction project around our, our precious collections. We feel very lucky, I think, to be on the other side of this work and everything is safe. Um, and we're really delighted with the results of our hard work and our research and our effort. We welcome 6,000 visitors to our reopening weekend. We um, were so happy to sort of see people back in the museum talking about art and being with us. Um, a giant kudos to the staff of the UMFA and in this particular conversation to our amazing conservation and collections staff um, who I hope you'll get to know and those, those technical questions that you might have. I would welcome that you direct them to Robin and Robin Elise and David. Um, but they were essential partners um, with great patience and expertise during our project because if, if, if we don't speak for the collections, nobody will. Um, and, and, and I just want to say um, what you do in closing is so important and uh, we're honored to have you here on our campus and in our community. I hope you have a wonderful visit to Salt Lake. Please do come and visit the UMFA. Your badge will allow you to walk right in the door and come for lunch. It's a lovely cafe. So thank you so much.